We are here with uh, Nick Baker, who is our director in the Office of Open Learning, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of what a week looks like in the life of an online student and how to best plan your courses and your lessons um, around what it is like to be an online student. So, Nick, what do you what do you have to tell us today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the message is keep it as simple as possible. That's that's the real thing here. Um, if you want them to survive and you want yourself to survive through this process, then uh, try to resist the urge to throw a whole lot of things into your course site just because it's easy to do that. Um, I think what you need to keep in mind is that um, there's a lot of things that are hidden in your planning in your regular classroom that you have to make explicit in, in the online environment because there isn't that kind of space where you're you're dialoguing about it. So you have to remember that the things, the kind of questions that you ask, the prompts that you use when you're in a face-to-face -face classroom have to go somewhere. You have to use an equivalent of those um, in the online environment. And so sometimes that is text-based. Sometimes it's in a little video like this. Um, sometimes it's in how you structure your activities. So the kind of, the, the instructions that you give your students, whether that's synchronous or asynchronous, um, will build in those prompts. So you see it in like textbook design, for example. If you're looking through a new textbook, one of the things that you're usually looking for is what are the kind of review questions that are at the end of the chapter? What are those little pull-out boxes? Um, where are the little prompt questions? The you know think about this now. You've just read this bit. What's the you know what does this all mean? Those are the things that you're actually trying to do in your online planning throughout a week. And I think you have to keep in mind that there are you know, there are these three key uh, interactions that are always going on. And those are student instructor. So you're, there's always that interaction going on. There's student to student. And then there's student and content. They're actually interacting okay. with that stuff. And you have to think about each of those three interactions because you're, you're kind of the puppet master in all of this in putting that together. So you have to be intentional about those. To create a really good learning environment, you've got to be intentional about how you put those three things together. Um, and it's it's really important in the online community to do that. So how do we see, um, you know, making these connections explicit and stuff in the in online environment and specifically, you know, in Blackboard, working in Blackboard, mm -hmm. building these connections between, you know, we've we've talked a bit about um, the instructor and the student, um, but what about student and student? What about student content? Right. So those two are, are a little bit trickier to manage sometimes. You, you can't always tell exactly how your student student interactions will go, for example, but thinking through at least throughout, if you take your course, at some point throughout there, there should be meaningful interactions between students. And maybe that's through a discussion for, maybe that's through peer feedback on um, on a draft of something that they're working on. There are lots of ways that you can get students to interact with each other and feel like they're part of a community of learners. And I think that's the really important thing here. So, and then student content interaction, that stuff um, sometimes happens in the presence of the instructor. But a lot of the time it doesn't. It's those bits that happen outside of your classroom, going away and reading and thinking about things and responding to questions and working through problems. Again, you have to just be really explicit about what you want them to do. And I think one of the other things to keep in mind is when you go to um, add a new piece of content to your course site, you have to walk through this process of why am I doing this? What is this piece adding to the learning outcomes? Do I really need to have it here? And if I don't, then maybe I, I should get rid of it. It's really difficult for us sometimes as as um, experts in the field to remember what it's like to be a novice. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to keep our content up to date and we come across this latest article that's just come out and you go, actually, that's awesome. That's something that they should really know about. And so I'll throw it in the course site. And it'll often go under other readings, but then the student is gonna open that folder and see that there's 2,700 other readings in there and they get overwhelmed by that. So anytime you add a piece like that to your course I think about what do you want your students to do with it be explicit about that in your own mind and then you can explain it to students how you want them to use it so think about what is a what does a course week look like from end to end or even smaller than that an activity for today um, right. those of us who have kids at home who are trying to learn how to learn in this space right now are faced with this really um, challenging problem of of what those directions look like 
Um, and you're seeing it on the other end, what happens when you don't get clear instructions or there are five different apps that you have to download and sign up for today. Try and minimize that stuff. Keep it as simple as possible. Right. So are, are there any things that you would um, specifically guard people against doing, um, you know, that, you, you know, common things that we see online instructors doing a little bit, um, you know, too often or not often enough or whatever? Yeah, I think the, the probably the number one challenge that I see that students face um, in online course design is that there just isn't enough um, explicit information for them about what they should be doing this week. So one of the challenges that the students will be facing is understanding how to learn in this space. They've, they've got a sense if they've um, been on campus for a while, they know what that rhythm feels like of going to class, um, you know, taking notes and then maybe doing some readings offline and so on. So you have to try and think about what that rhythm looks like for these students and help to set that rhythm. And so sometimes that means, you know, we've talked a little bit about announcements, maybe an announcement in the beginning of the week that sets up the tasks that you want them to complete this week. Um, passing out the things that you absolutely have to do in a, in a synchronous session and then thinking through if a student was doing this without me there, what would they need to know? What would that voice need to sound like that was telling them all of the things that they need to know to be able to do this activity? Um, and I think that's the piece that's often missing. That's the connection, the connection between all of the pieces in the course that um, that we see people struggle with. Uh, and I think it's it's really just a matter of a habit of getting into to to your mind, into the mindset of thinking through, if I'm suddenly not there, could my students continue to do this work, and what would it look like? Right. So if if someone is planning, for example, um, to have a completely asynchronous course, um, you know, it seems like there would need to be much more kind of front loaded um, planning and organization that would that would go into that. So that, Absolutely. you know, so that even if you're not having those live sessions that that students are able to kind of self regulate and kind of establish that that pattern mm -hmm. you know, throughout the throughout the weeks. Is that Kind of that's, what you're saying. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. And I'd say, um, so if you're doing a completely asynchronous course, that certainly ups the game in terms of the, the importance of those instructions and things that you give people um, and how you build um, instruction around activities. Um, it also means that you have to be really careful about the consistency throughout the course and um, predictability. So students need to know that, you know, every week there's going to be this type of work that I need to do uh, and I'm going to go to this place to find that stuff and I'm going to have a reminder that's going to say to me this is what you're supposed to be doing this week but I also have that information in the syllabus or somewhere else where I've got a map that says you know week two I'm supposed to read these things I'm supposed to do these activities and I'm supposed to submit this um, and you know don't forget also to check into the discussion forums and um, and and here's another space that, that I want you to, to work on. So those have to be really visible to students. Um, and the more you can do that, I know this all is probably sounding like, this is wow, this is a lot of work. Yes, it is a lot of work to do this well online. But also, the more you can do this front-loading, uh, the less hundreds of emails you're going to get from students who can't figure out where this thing is you just told them to go do. Uh, so it does it does really help your help your life if you've got a really big class this is essential right so maybe a little bit too of that uh, front-ended communication about how to do things and you know mm -hmm. a bit about that navigation of the site to get people set up to effectively use the site properly yeah absolutely doing that right from the beginning so sometimes we'll use something like a, a lesson zero we might call it and that's the how do you lead people through the course? What are the pieces of the course that they need to be aware of, the tools that they need to try out, just like we you know, would in, in this course, for example, you might go, um, you've experimented with submitting an assignment, with completing a, a quiz. That practice teaches the students what they need to do and also re reduces their anxiety a lot. Right. So you're less likely to get a lot of those communications as a result. 
Yeah. So so having um, practice options too. you know, having a low stakes assessment where students can submit something early in the semester to get used to using the tool or a quiz or um, even, you know, using the virtual classroom or whatever tools that you have allowing people to practice in a, in a low yeah. stakes or no stakes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's and there's one other thing that I'll say that it might sound a little bit contradictory here. So um, you want to set enough structure that students don't get lost. You don't want to set such rigid boundaries around the walls of this thing that you're calling your course that um, it will also cause problems. So by that, you might think of an example like I've given students an assignment to go uh, to work on some calculations that I need them to do, and I want them to use a spreadsheet to do that. So my instructions to them are to use a spreadsheet. I don't care whether they use Excel or Google Sheets or LibreOffice, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as it'll perform the functions that they need to do, so that if you give them some agency around being able to use the tools that they are comfortable and familiar with and have access to, rather than insisting that it has to be Excel, then um, that'll also kind of reduce the anxiety a little bit. Try and think of those activities in terms of concepts rather than you know, tools. Right. It's more important to get the concepts across and to have them learning the content than it is to, um, you know, have them using a specific tool, unless it's necessary for that profession, obviously. Unless right? it's yeah. necessary, uh, it's the only thing that gets used in that profession sort of thing. Right. But there are very few of those. Um, yeah, those are, those are kind of key things to keep in mind. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I think we have kind of a, a better idea about, you know, how what it looks like to plan uh, a week in an online course and the things that you need to be considering um, that you might not you might take for granted when you're in the face to face sessions. Um, so do you have anything else to add? There's only one thing I will say that I want to add to the end of this, and that is that at this time, a lot of you are probably getting lots of things popping up from companies who are saying we can we can do this for you. We've got this magical piece of software and we're going to give it to you free for the next two months. Um, take it and use it. If you can possibly resist that, uh, resist the urge, even if it looks like it is magical, um, I would say just if you can stick to the tools that we have, the tools that are vetted and safe and we know that students are able to use and students have access to and will keep access to for the whole duration of your course and which are um, you know not going to cause any huge privacy issues and so on uh, try and resist signing up for anything new and try and resist signing up signing them up for six different new things at once uh, use the tools that we have Right. A word of caution. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Ash. Thanks, yeah. team.